Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to have uh, Brian McVeigh back talking about ideas of Julian Chains. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the nature of the self. So welcome, Brian. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you everyone else for uh, coming today. So let me begin by saying that in the same way that the word consciousness gives a lot of problems uh, when we try to understand exactly what James meant by it or what I meant by it. People have different ideas. That's the same thing with the word self. It's used in a variety of ways. But today I'm going to use it in several special ways. So we really want to pay attention to what I mean by the self in the same way uh, that we did for the word consciousness. So I think usually when people hear the word self, often they think that it, it defines some sort of uh, executive ego or the center of our personality that controls everything else about ourselves or some sort of essential identity. Um, I'm going to challenge that view. I don't think that there is an executive ego inside our head. And uh, of course, we can talk about that later, but I just want to put that out there now. And the other thing about the self there are two ways to look at it. One way is interpersonal, or in other words, relationships between people and the, the, the identities that society gives us. Um, and uh, we have to ask ourselves to what degree do our self presentations change depending on the situation that we're in. As I was saying, I, let's begin to look at the self from two angles. One is a social angle or what we can call interpersonal, how we relate to other people and how we learn to have uh, a self-identity information we absorb from the environment. The other type of self is intrapersonal. In other words, a self within us, a self that perhaps only we know. But this is where we want to remember what we talked about uh, in terms of James in psychology. Brian, Brian, let's do one last thing. Uh, sure. If you go back to the audio settings uh, and go to the up arrow and audio settings and okay. raise the level of the sound to 75%. Okay, it was at 75. Maybe I'll raise it a little bit little more. A bit, little bit more. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Perfect, perfect. Much better. Go ahead. Okay. So... Now we want to go back and think of things, uh, what we said about the I and the me, if you remember, for those of you who were in the pr previous sessions. So this is important. So when we talk about the interpersonal self, there are two aspects, the active analog I, and then what we can call the passive me. And I think it's important to remember that almost all languages grammatically make a distinction between what we call in English, I and me. And there's a reason for that. I think it has to do with the way we interact with society and how we interact with ourselves. So instead of saying interpersonal, sometimes I think it's better to say inter-self. In other words, there are two parts of the self that are always in this dynamic relationship, the I and the me. And later on in discussion, of course, we can give more uh, specific examples uh, of that. So the next thing I want to do is look at the self from uh, three different angles. As a systems, as something sequential, and as something dramatized. And again, this will be a little bit abstract, but hopefully in discussion we can come up with some specific examples. So when we, when we think of systems theory, I, I think a, a one way to look at it is older science used to prefer to break things down into different components, take an analytic approach. But now scientists understand, especially when it comes to living organisms or the natural environment, a systems approach tells us a lot more. And this is true, I think, for psychology and for trying to understand what the self is. So there are many examples of systems and communication, uh, for example, ant colonies or a flock of birds. We always think that there must be some executive controller 
there must be uh, something, there must be one bird who is the leader of the other birds. But actually, it's more complicated than that. That's not necessarily the case. And yet, the flock works as a system. And that is the same thing, I think, with the human mind. There is no little person in my head pulling the levers. There is no supervising executive ego. Rather, the mind is a system. And so that's how we have to view how the I and the me relate as a complicated dynamic system. In fact, the whole mind itself is a system. And later on, hopefully, that will become uh, clear why I'm making that uh, statement now. Uh, and especially when it comes to something practical, such as therapy, anytime you have a therapeutic session, it's going to be a therapist and a client. And the question is, how does the client emotionally, psychologically improve? Well, it's because they're part of a system. And especially if you have a, a group, a group therapy, it gets very complicated, the dynamics. But the idea is, you can begin to understand what those dynamics are if you view it as a system. Uh, related to this is the, the, this sort of system approach is how the mind is something that is interconnected, networked, interlinked with the social and natural environment in the way that our bodies are not. Of course, our bodies are part of systems but especially the mind, because there's so much information that the brain must process. So we have to view the mind as, uh, I don't like to use a metaphor, but almost as a computer that constantly is upgrading information. That's why when it comes to counseling, it's very different, of course, from the medical sciences, because in medicine, we can have uh, very uh, detailed uh, measurements if someone is improving or not. I mean, not always, of course, but when it comes to psychological healing, it's much more difficult to find out what those metrics are. Uh, but in any case, and the reason for that, the reason why it's difficult to measure changes in the mind is because the mind, as I said, it's constantly upgrading because it's, it's a part of a larger system, whether that system is a group, a family, or the, uh, a community, however you want to measure things, the mind never stands alone. And of course, this relates to the nature of uh, the self. So the next thing I want to talk about is this idea of the sequential self as the self that is constantly changing. And this is where uh, Buddhism comes in, actually. And there's uh, uh, one writer has used this expression to talk about how the self is temporarily being created uh, moment by moment. And he uses, this is a very uh, uh, long expression, but it's something like subjects of experience that are single mental things. <laughs> and what does that mean? <laughs> I think a better way is to view the self as separate pearls on a pearl necklace. And there's a string, and that string is time. But each pearl is a different version of the self being recreated moment by moment. So that's where Buddhism comes in. So the idea is there is no one continuity. There is no essential continuity underlying our sense of selfhood. There's the illusion that there is. Of course, we have this powerful illusion that I am always the same person all the time. But as I said, the mind is extremely complicated. It's constantly changing moment by moment. It's always being upgraded. And once we look at the mind from that perspective, we begin to have a better understanding of what the self is. And again, to go back to some concepts we talked about earlier that have to do with consciousness, excerptions. Remember, that's a key feature of consciousness. So the mind excerpts information or bits of information from this a stream of consciousness, and it constructs a self. And it usually constructs a self with a certain amount of sameness. So that gives us the illusion that there is only one self uh, per person. And this also relates to this idea of self narratization Because we narratize ourselves, we assume there must be the same self. But in fact, uh, I, I don't think that's true. And again, 
it, from a purely everyday perspective, it doesn't seem to matter. But when it comes to understanding what exactly the self is doing, we have to really pay attention to these nitty gritty details in order to have a better view of what the self is. I think another uh, useful metaphor to understand how the, we have this illusion of the same self is what is called the flicker fusion effect. So that's how movies are made, right? A, a movie is a uh, series of separate frames, but because they move so fast, there's an illusion of continuity. When I was a small child, I used to take a thick pad and on each pad, I would draw a little picture in the corner. And the, the, on the next page, I would change the picture a little bit, like someone throwing a ball step by step. And then when you would flip the pages quickly, it would look like there was motion. That's the same thing with the self. So the idea here is that the self leapfrogs through time and just jumps off from uh, previous versions. So the final perspective about the self that I want to uh, briefly talk about is what I call the dramatized self. The metaphor that the self or that social relations um, are somehow a type of drama, that, that's, a, that's a staple in the social sciences. And a lot of very important social scientific descriptions have been based on this metaphor. So in a sense, there's nothing new here, but I push it theoretically um, I, I sort of push the envelope on what does that mean if uh, we are just a series of different roles. I mean, that, that word role, of course, comes from the stage. But we know, of course, in anthropology, sociology, psychology, we use that word, that powerful metaphor of role. What does that mean? Why is that metaphor so powerful? I think it's so powerful because actually we are dramatic beings. Uh, so in order to understand itself, we have to look at it as, a, as a, something that's dramatized. We have to really pay attention to this idea of role playing. And again, there's a, uh, a practical uh, therapeutic uh, angle here, which is that uh, if you want to improve yourself, you have to start by looking at the roles you're playing. What scripts have your parents given you? What scripts have, has society given you that are not working anymore? How do you re rewrite these scripts? <clears throat> Excuse me. And in fact, as we know, there's a whole uh, type of therapy, psychodrama developed by uh, Jacob uh, Moreno. He uh, passed away in 1974, but I, we, I won't go into details about, about psychodrama now. I, I'm, I think we're all familiar with it, but what's important to keep in mind is that he developed an entire body of work based on this idea that the individual is very much a dramatic uh, being. Um, the, uh, I guess <coughs> where I push this metaphor um, beyond the psychodrama account is that I take very seriously the idea that we are composed of an I and a me. I, I don't think it's just really a metaphor in a sense. I think this is very important for understanding how people can change. Uh, so as I said, there's a, a, a practical view to all this. So um, I guess if there's a takeaway message from what I'm trying to say now, it's that our relationship with ourself, our inter-self relationship, is just as important as our interpersonal relations or our, our relationships with other people. And I think that as a, as a species, as a social being, that's where we're going in the same way that we, according to Jane's, we developed a bicameral mentality to deal with complexity. Then we had to develop consciousness or conscious interiority. I think the, the future will see us having cells that are so complex that we have that it becomes necessary to understand what it means to be human by looking at our multi-rolled cells and by looking at this idea where we have an analog eye and different me's and we can view me's as different roles or different versions of ourself and the me excuse me the i 
is a type of director, to use a theatrical metaphor again. The I is supervising and telling the me what to do. But at the same time, of course, the I is a creation of the mind itself. There is no ultimate ego. Um, so, you know, what I've been talking about is a bit philosophical, perhaps a bit abstract, but I just want to sort of lay out some key ideas and hopefully we can uh, flesh these, these concepts out in the, in the discussion. Thank you very much. So Brian, what I'm going to do now is I've been keeping notes. So I'm going to ask you questions to kind of elaborate each of these points. And then we will go to the breakout rooms um, and people can discuss it in detail. And then we can come back. They can talk about their takeaways and ask questions. Okay. So um, first, this idea, let, let's, let's come back to uh, Julian Jane's idea of mental space and analog eye. So I'm trying to first try to get this distinction between I and me. So I, like for, okay, let, let, let's take the extreme situation. So when you do not have, when, when you do not, when you have not created the mental space, because creating the mental space is an effort, effort driven action, right? that you, you are creating a mental space in which you are seeing something. So it's not, it's kind of rising above this stimulus response. You're trying to kind of step back and look at what is going on. So when, you, so first question to you is, what is the I? What is I as opposed to me? Well, yeah, so that, that's a good question. And I think that the best way to answer that is to just compare them. So, an I is uh, the active part of ourself, whereas the me is the passive aspect. And so pa by passive, I mean, uh, well, in the medical sciences, they would say a patient, you're an object that someone does something to. So for example, when someone speaks to you, you're a listener, your me is engaged. If someone throws a ball at you, your passive, the ball is coming to you, where an I is that aspect of self, whether it's intrapersonal or interpersonal, that is uh, doing something. Uh, the, the, the I, you might uh, call it an agent. And as I said before, I like to use the uh, metaphor of grammar. So it's, it's the same difference between a subject pronoun and an object pronoun. So of course, the, the subject pronoun would be the I and then the object pronoun would be the me. So um, approaching it another way, um, me is always there because the, the passive me is always there. But is I always there? Um, <clears throat> that, that's, that, that's difficult to answer. Actually, I would say they're probably always there, but they don't, they're, they're not activated unless we're conscious unless we're really trying to picture ourselves in our mental space. Um, the, the, does that Got make sense? Got it. So, so what you're saying is that it's like, so the, the active part looking at the passive part, yes. that's what I looking at me is. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that depending on the role, there are multiple me's. That's yes. one of the points you're making. Yes. Um, in, I mean, to put it in a uh, kind of a uh, very distinct context is that you might be playing a certain role at work and you may be playing a different role in your family. Yes. So your conception of me is going to be different. So, and with your friends, you may be something, there may be another me. So there are this constellation of me's. Is that what you're saying? Now, Yes. Are there constellations, or, or is the I remain the same, or I changes too? Um, well, I, I hate to put it this way, but yes and no. <laughs> so, of course, the I changes as we, as, as, as an individual change, our self-identity changes. But in a way, the I is always the same because the I is just a point of observation. The, the eye is just a sense we have of looking at someone, looking at ourselves, looking outside at the world, looking within ourselves at our, our, our mental 
the, the contents of our mental space. So it, you know, the, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say there, it really depends on what perspective you're looking at. There are multiple de definitions, there are multiple functions of the I, but at its most simplest, uh, in mo the, the, the most simple way to put it, I should say, is that the, the I is an observer, whereas the me is observed, the, the sense that you're being observed by yourself or by other people. And uh, the, the, the idea is that there's only one I, but there are many me's or many roles, many, uh, many versions of myself. Got it, got it. So it's basically your capacity of paying attention or you are paying attention. So the, uh, and you can be paying attention to multiple parts of you, like multiple roles yes. of you, but it's the act of paying attention is the active element of paying attention. Okay. I got think it. that's a good way to put it. The I is the act of focusing on something. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, I, I think I've always thought attention as being a very core concept in psychology. You know, mm -hmm. this comes from, I think, uh, William James, I, I learned this from, you know, mm -hmm. he talks about, even he, got, he looks at will as being, paying attention to difficult objects. So attention is a huge, huge concept. Mm -hmm. um, now you talked about systems. Now that's really interesting that we are, uh, especially the point that you made about social systems, that how you are kind of, you're immersed in the social systems and our mind, our consciousness, both kind of conscious part, as well as the subconscious part is affecting and being affected by people around you. And you can't really understand yourself without taking cognizance of that entire system in which you are operating. Yes. Is that a fair way of saying that? Yes. And, you know, in the, to, to use a practical example, in counseling, the point you just made may not be so obvious to people, but it becomes very obvious when we do family therapy. And then you see that actually I'm reacting that way because in the back of my mind, I'm mad at my mother or I'm worried about what my father's going to say. I don't get away, get along with my siblings. And in, so in family therapy, it's very clear that we are parts of a system. But my argument is that we're still parts of a system, even outside the family. We just don't think in those terms usually, but we have to become a human being. We have to be socialized. And to be socialized means to be part of something larger than ourselves. Yeah, the interesting thing is that you know, things like family or people whom we are close to, even when they are not present, they are kind of, you, they are there in your consciousness, in a kind of your subconscious, you kind of react, you know, what would they say or what, how would they react is part of how, right. how you're operating. So uh, it's kind of like, like uh, Julian Jane's voices, you know, those voices are there with you of, of all the people that you're close to and you're, you're reacting to that even when you are alone. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, let's talk about the sequential self. Now that's, that's a very interesting point of saying that we change over time, but we mistakenly think that we are more constant than we actually are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and you're looking at it over time. Okay. So uh, let's look at it. You know, the issue of drama is a separate point. So firstly, just about time. So how, how do you think about, you know, in terms of change in people? Now, this is a very broad question. Like, are you talking about your change over the years, over days, over minutes, over seconds? How, how, how much variation is there? I mean, how, how, how do you see the self varying over time? So that's a very important uh, issue. And it's just my personal bias that um, psychologists really have to pay attention to time. 
at all levels. And of course, there's a whole field, developmental psychology. So it's not as if psychologists ignore time. But to answer your question, I would look at all different, uh, uh, different types of time, developmental from when you're an infant and adolescent and adult and you become old, that's important to pay attention to. But also how we change uh, day to day uh, and indeed, even from moment to moment, which is difficult, more difficult to measure, but I think it does happen. And to sort of step back even more, the problem with psychology is they only pay attention to de developmental time. They don't, they ignore time, or, or, and they also pay attention, I should add, to evolutionary time over hundreds of thousands of millions of years but they do not pay attention to changes that transpired over several centuries. And of course, this is where Julian James comes in. And because they don't do that, psychologists have a very distorted view of what it means to be human. But in any case, to try to more directly answer your question, I think we have to look at all different types of time, whether it's developmental, whether it's historical, or whether it's moment to moment. Because I think that when we understand the, the role of time, we begin to see that the human mind cannot be understood or explained unless it's viewed as something temporal, as something that has a lot to do with time and change. Um, let me ask another very odd question. Do you think most people are more the same as compared to what they actually are? Or do you think most people actually change a lot more than what they think that they are? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. I would think that probably most people change more than they think over time, over, over their lifetime. Um, and, and, you know, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that, it's difficult to answer. I, I, I'm sure there's been research done on that, actually. But my personal feeling is that people have, people evolve in, during their lifetime. Not everything changes. They don't completely change, of course, but there are probably aspects of their cells that have changed over time. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a very powerful issue because what, it, what I found is that, at least for me and for many people I know, most people I know, um, their conception of how static they are their conception of how static they are is holds them back from making the change. Right. Yes. They yeah. could change actually quite easily, but they just believe that that's what they are. Right. So they never even try. And once they actually try, it's actually quite easy. So it's kind of like, it's, it's like your own limitations, own consideration of limitations that you have, which are kind of artificially made, are much more of a limit, kind of this internally generated limitations, as opposed to actual limitations. Right. I, I, I absolutely agree. And th this is why one way to show people that they have changed or can change is to use this theatrical metaphor of roles. Mm -hmm. and, and to, of course, in the therapeutic session, there are many things you can do to show people that they probably have changed. And the most important thing is, is that they can change. And again, to get, a, you know, that's why we have to go a little bit deeper, get a little more termino terminological and use these expressions such as the I and the me and how the I can direct the me and how me's really are just different versions or different uh uh, different uh, me's that, uh, you know, going toward the future, we can come up with a, a future version. And looking in the past, we can look at old cells that don't work anymore. And how can we uh, change uh, these old versions of ourselves? Wonderful. So I want to ask you just one question about this dramatized uh, style. So what do you actually do in therapy? I mean, how, how, how is this used in therapy, the idea of trauma? Well, of course, you know, people who I, I'm not formally trained in psychodrama. And as I said, there's a whole tradition, uh, a whole school that, um, uh, that, that is very well developed 
And uh, so just to sort of give you an idea what they do is, uh, and, and usually it's in a group uh, setting, they'll have, they'll have uh, one person come in front of the group and uh, ask them to play a role. And, uh, and then they'll ask the person, what do you feel like physically, not just your thoughts? Because a lot of psychodrama actually is very bodily based. It's very experiential. Um, and then they'll ask the person, well, what about if you change that role? Okay. And you'll have different people in the group play different roles, perhaps. There's many different ways. It's really infinite, the, 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 the different things you can do. And, but in any case, you'll have somebody play the person's father, for example, that, the, that, that the, the identified patient does not get along with. And then you'll ask the identified patient, well, this time when you are playing yourself via via your father, change the script and see what that feels like. And so you teach people to, you, you let them know that actually taking these chances of speaking differently, of acting differently, of feeling differently, are not as threatening as they once thought. Wonderful. So what I want to what, what I propose to do now is that I propose that we should go to the uh, breakout rooms. So folks, what we are discussing in the breakout rooms are the ideas that Brian has presented. So first, uh, let's see. Could you elaborate on the idea that we may be moving towards many more me's? Uh, Jane, you can ask the question when you come back. Okay, uh, when after the breakout rooms, there'll be plenty of time to ask uh, questions. So the topics that, hi Claire, welcome. Um, the topics that we have put on the table are the distinction between I and me and the idea of kind of multiple me's. Uh, second was the notion of looking at self as part of a system. Okay, what do you think about that of the, being able to kind of look at your entire social system and regarding yourself as part of that. Uh, third is to understand the role of time in the concept of self. And the fourth was the idea of, uh, you know, using drama, you know, dramatized self uh, roles uh, as a tool about thinking about self. So those are the four points. It's going to be Linda followed by Laura. Linda. Uh, I've, I've always felt that we, we play different roles depending on the people we're with, the circumstances. Uh, but I have a question about this I and sequential changes. Brian, I, you talk about over periods of time there are, are changes. I'm curious, do you believe that it's possible for the I that starts out uh, over a period of time to be almost a totally different um, I? Sure, I, I do. I, I mean, I view the, it, it gets a little difficult to explain, I suppose, but I view the I as just a point of observation okay. of what's going on inside your mind. However, that point of observation is being fed a tremendous amount of information mm -hmm. in a non-conscious way, because every day we wake, I always tell my clients, every day we wake up, we're a different person. It doesn't seem that way. But we're constantly being upgraded. And so, yes, I, I would say that the I can change. But um, Linda, you meant me changing, right? No, no. Oh, I changing the, the, the observer. Okay, wow. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Next up is Laura. Our question was the same. Okay. About the I changing. So. All right. Uh, next up. Uh, thank you, Laura. Next up is Jane, Rob, and Jyoti. Jane. Yes, so... Um... In the course of the discussion, I got confused about the me being passive, but the me playing a role. So could you speak to how, whether the me is actually active when it's playing a role? I guess that, that just seemed like a disjunction of how, how you conceive of the me's in roles. Make any sense? Sure. No, I, I understand. I, I uh, perfectly understand. I, I think uh, your question, and it's very easy to, to uh, become confused. And I just want to say that, like a lot of you, I also struggle with trying to understand um, how the mind works. And so, that 
to answer your question, yes, the me is a role and the me is passive, but it's a role in the sense that it's being observed by the I. The me as a role is being directed, to use a theatrical metaphor, by the I. Uh, does that, um, because we're always- Can you give an example maybe of, um, so it's not a role in that the me is responding to the situation. It's just a, a position in relation to the situation. And maybe an example would help. <laughs> okay, an example. <laughs> well, okay, you, you know, uh, so you don't get along with your mother or something. I just be a little bit uh, psychoanalytic. Um, so the idea is to develop a different role, which would be a different me, but it's a different me in this context because the I can hopefully select that me. It can select a, a different me in order to um, uh, interact in a healthier way with your mother. So we, the I and the me are, are constantly being created by the mind. They're not structural entities. They're not these two things always floating around in the mind. These are just mental representations that the that the that our non-conscious mental machinery is constantly changing and upgrading. It's just a convenient way. They're, they're kind of fictional in a sense. They're just a convenient way for the mind to organize social relations and to organize how we as an individual are interacting with our environment. Thank you. Uh, next up. Uh, next up is going to be Rob followed by Jyoti. Rob. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks. It's interesting. Um, so three of the people in, in uh, the group that I was in talked about how roles seem to come up when they travel to different places. So this is like you, it, it's noticeable because you haven't gone to sleep and woken up the next day. So you're on a plane, uh, you leave the airport one role, and when you drop down into the new country or wherever you are, you have a new role. Or you know, it could be uh, different people you're around or a different language that you're speaking, a uh, different role comes to the fore. Um, but um, so that was interesting. I don't know if that helps uh, well, or confuses, the, it muddies the water about what roles are, but. Um, okay. So no, my question would be about uh, where, does the eye have emotion that's specific to the eye or is there an emotion that you would have feelings like mad, sad, glad, scared? Um, do, does the eye have feelings or are those only from the me's? The feelings draw or come from the me and the eye observes the feeling. That's the question. Well, as I said, I think uh, the way to view the I and the me, they're, they're reference points in our mind. They're not actually persons. Uh, they're not actually full-blown selves either, we might say. They're just aspects of self. So I don't know if I would say that the I itself experiences emotions. I would say that the person through the I or the individual using the I experiences emotions as the I observes different me's. And remember, me's are also past versions of ourselves. They can be future versions, they could be past versions. And so I didn't talk too much about it today, but the, the, what the complication here is, um, and I think what Jane said, Jane brought up a really good question because it, 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 it shows us the complexity of the relationship between the I and the me. The I and the me are in, constant, in a constant dynamic relationship. And that's where things uh, get a little bit uh, complicated. But um, I, the point I want to make is that these are not set things in our heads. Rather, these are just convenient ways our mind um, employs in order to organize how the person is going to react to other people, how the person is going to react uh, to him or herself. Next up is Jyoti, Judith, and Kevin. Jyoti. Yeah, I have a, 
three questions, but I'm going to see if I can merge the second question into the first one and forget about the third question because of the time constraints. Uh, the question is, if you are constantly upgrading yourself and what happens to your identity? And if you have a bad experience, can you go back to your ungraded self? Do you go back to your ungraded self? Or there are some, you know, there's a hierarchy that you follow. So I think the, that, that's a good question. It's a difficult question to answer, but what I would say is that if you had a bad experience, especially if it's a traumatic experience, from a clinical point of view, you will never go back completely to your old self, even though you're upgrading. Um, and so you have to sort of deal with a type of grief. Again, if it's a very traumatic incident, you have to deal with how to let that old self go and develop a new self. It doesn't mean you completely let that old information that constituted that old self disappear completely. It's just that it has to be changed because as, I, as we talked about before, I think that we are always changing and we're always upgrading. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, yes and no. Uh, because I was uh, hoping uh, that there would be like a hierarchy. If you had a bad experience, you have, like you said, if you had some kind of tra trauma, uh, you would probably first go back to your original identity and then probably slowly, slowly rank up. You will never go back to the times when you will never go back to the self that was, you had upgraded right. uh, with your time. That's what I'm trying to say. And if, uh, if we, let's say in a divorce, uh, people get married to each other because they think, oh, I don't like this about him or her, but I can change him. He will change with me. And that never happens. Yes. People don't change. And then there is a divorce. So how do you account for this upgrading system that we have? Well, uh, it, it doesn't, when we say upgrade, it doesn't mean that someone is always, that they're always going to upgrade in the way that we want to. And there may be upgrading, but it's not necessarily going in a positive direction. It could be a sort of dysfunctional, malfunctioning type of upgrading. Upgrading just means new information coming in that I try to accommodate and fit into my mind. It may go in a better direction, but it may not go in a better direction. Thank you. Next up is Judith, Kevin, Trevor, and Rojin. Judith. Judith. Yeah, so um, I'm glad to talk after Joy too because I actually um, have a similar line of thought. Um, the eyes and the me's um, part of the discussion is still something I'm working with, trying to understand. Um, but these, this idea of time um, is interesting to me because I, I think, I feel like when um, we're older, like like much older decades, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on. Um, and we can look back um, on the old me's or eyes, whatever, I don't know what to call them, um, and, and think of where we are and who we were. It's just so interesting because you, some ways you feel like you haven't changed and you know that Briggs Myers or Myers Briggs thing comes up and you're like yeah that's my personality type that's why I am that way but Shrikant what you said also is so true because when you do that you can poke at those places where like am I really that fixed you know like what about this you know I, I could be different which is so cool and I don't and you know this is something that you have more of an opportunity to really get perspective on as you age I feel so my question, I guess, is like, um, if you could address, like, many times they say people get very rigid in their old age, and they can't, you know, an old dog doesn't change, whatever that idiom is. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, like, I just think that there's so much opportunity to look in hindsight, like who we want to be, create different me's, you know, test the world, um, that 
aren't necessarily apparent to us when we don't have the hindsight of who we've been and what what we've done. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. That's uh, yeah, actually that's something I think about a lot myself. Um, I meet people uh, who are who come in to see me for help. They're in their fifties or sixties, and I'm always surprised because it seems to me, you know, these are not young people, but they want to change. And they want to change because they're looking back now, they have something to look at. It's very difficult to change if we don't have something to look at. <laughs> and the more decades you have between the time you're born and when you're looking back at yourself, the more opportunities actually you do have to change. You, there's also some opportunities for regret and sadness too. But in any case, this idea that you can't teach old dog new tricks, I, of course, disagree with. I think that, I don't know about dogs, but I know about people, you can change them for the better. You can teach them no matter where they are, um, no matter how old they are. And I think this idea of, of being rigid, there are people who are rigid. Of course, that's a defect um, because I think humans do have a natural inbuilt capability to adapt and to change. And we really want to cultivate a society where we encourage people not to be rigid. We encourage people to be open to new experiences and to change. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin, Trevor, Rojin, and Linda. Kevin. Thank you. Nice to see you again, uh, Brian. Um, my question is, so what's the language complete to here? It's, for example, it's, if I base the uh, inaccurate or limited information, how I direct me. The possible is like the, if let's say you use binary thinking, I know uh, that's something wrong. I build my system by system, year by year, read the books and uh, I'm, you know, 45 years, everything works. So I already build my value system. So this kind of assumption it's going to direct me in a different ways. Maybe I think that me action is great, but other folks may be different. Even myself thought back need to upgrade. Mm -hmm. I would hear your thoughts, thank you. Yeah, so if I understand you correctly, um, how I view myself often is very different from how other people view me. And that can be a problem. If I'm causing trouble for other people in my life, because there's something rigid about me that needs to be changed. Um, of course, that needs to be addressed. So, um, and I think that's a key part of adapting and changing is listening to what other people say about us. Not to the point where we lose our self-confidence, not to the point where we become paranoid about what other people think or say about us, but at least having an open mind uh, because that's the most important arena as a human being that we operate in is with other people. So we should always be uh, cognizant of what, uh, what, what messages people are sending us, whether they're explicit or implicit uh, types of uh, messages. Trevor, you're next. Okay, I kind of have a silly question, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Um, so all these slippery ideas we're talking about here, um, the me, the I, perception of reality, these different things. The general public has almost no knowledge, even of the existence of these ideas, let alone they actually think about them. Um, the typical person is completely immersed in reality. So my idea is uh, if, we could, if we could achieve some sort of widespread awareness that, that reality as we had experienced it is very much an illusion. And if we could get people to kind of collectively think of the system we live in, reality, the world, if we get them to think of it as a simulation, like, like a video game. And as a video game, it's not hard to conceptualize the idea that you're able to act upon the video game can get characters to do certain things. If, if we could get people to think of it this way, would it, might it give humanity kind of an increased sense of volition? And would it increase the likelihood of us being willing to participate in 
constructive brainstorming for better ways to run the world. So basically, is if we, if we could get kind of, if we could trick people into some degree of enlightenment, but without telling them that's what you're doing, could you get people to maybe stop being so foolish? Um, that's a uh, that's a very uh, big question. Uh, you, you said some things I think are very interesting. This idea of simulation, that when we simulate something, we know that it's not real, so it gives us a sense of more choices, and it increases our self autonomy, our volition, and I and I think that's true. Um, and you know, in this discussion, we've the, the word illusion has come up a lot. This idea. For example, the I and me are just fictions. They're a type of illusion. Their self is a type of illusion. But we don't want to stress that word too much, I think, because illusion, the way, I'm, the way I use it, it doesn't mean something is not real. It just means it's not real in the way I thought it was. That's a very important distinction. Uh, from a practical point of view, how to convince people that reality is a type of simulation that their views of themselves are not set in stone, that we can change, we can come up with new, uh, uh, more healthy stories about ourselves. How do we do that? Um, I don't have an answer, but I do agree with what you seem to be saying about a philosophy of teaching people somehow that we are not, uh, uh, we are not stuck in the choices we make, that we do have choices. We just have to learn where to look for those choices. Uh, Trevor, I have to disagree with you. That was not a silly question. That was a profound question. Uh, yes, I, I, I would agree too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I would say is that if you look at the whole work of Julian Jaynes, it is along the same lines. What it is is that most people, like if you look at the bicameral, people are mostly sleepwalking. People are mostly reacting. People are going with their habits. They are really not aware, self-aware of what they are doing. They're just doing it because it's habitual and it's not only within them, but they are doing that as a group. So there is like a, all these kind of things are passing between people uh, subconsciously. Uh, and that's how people are operating most of the time. The heart of consciousness is that creation of mental space. And I think simulation is the right concept. What you're doing in that mental space is that you're simulating what is possible. It allows you to get a distance from what is happening to see the possibilities of what can happen and what would happen if I did that, what would happen if I did that. So it is, uh, I think simulation actually captures what consciousness is, what our volitional faculty, what our uh, self-awareness, what our I is, it is a process of simulation. Um, and what that does is that it gives us enormous amount of control and ability to regulate and ability to correct our automatic processes. Um, and to the extent to which people, you can communicate it, you know, that anybody gets it, they have a better control over their life. They are able to fix things by themselves. And so uh, Julian James calls it the greatest inheritance, you know, the, you know, the magnificent inheritance of, uh, of human beings, you know, that, that's our cultural inheritance. And so that's what it is. And I think all the ideas that um, Brian is talking about here, about even looking at history, right? So being aware, that you have been like this over a period of time gives you the possibility of saying, oh, I could be otherwise. I could have done this. I could have done this. In the future, I can do this. You have those data points. It's part of the story. And you can say that I can modify the story. Uh, the part of playing roles is about this, about doing the simulation. Um, so it's, it's a very core idea. So wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor. Uh, next up is Rojin, uh, Linda, Mike, uh, Govert, and Laura. Rojin. Okay. Um, I have, it's basically uh, how to use the words question. 
not I'm not asking for advice. Um, I really want to figure out how to use the concepts behind the words. Um, yesterday, in the space of like six hours, uh, I have. Virgin, oh, we should not talk about personal experiences here. We well, we just talk about, about it at the general level. level. Okay, the I, the director uh, said, don't react that way. And uh, some stuff happened. Um, Mies uh, showed up and afterward, it seemed like the I, had changed uh, in the space of like five hours. Uh, does that seem like I'm using the concepts correctly? Yes, and uh, I, I, I wanna go back, uh, you know, Tre Trevor mentioned uh, slippery. These concepts are very slippery, I and me. And as I said, uh, I, I also struggle uh, with trying to come up with a theoretical framework how to explain all this. And by the way, if anyone is interested, I have published something on this, on the relationship with I and me that goes into more depth if anyone's interested. But uh, to answer what, the, to address what you just said, yes. So the, the me has an experience or yourself, has, whatever you wanna call it. And then that feeds back into the mind and that comes back up to the I and then your I is different. And then the I looks at another me. And so these things are very much related. How to describe that relationship, of course, is not easy, but um, I'm glad well, whatever happened to you, uh, it worked out that way in that uh, you were able to look at yourself or the situation from a different angle. Uh, thank you. Next up is uh, Linda, Mike, Govert, and Laura. Linda. Uh, I posed this question before and I, and I think a number of us have, have uh, questions about it. I guess in a sense, I'm concerned about how much the I changes. Uh, you know, I understand that we're learning, you know, we adapt to the learning, but is there no, is there nothing that's permanent about the I? You know, you basically have said that there is not, and I kind of worry about that. Um, well, I, 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 I suspect some, some people feel uncomfortable with this type of discussion because basically what we're saying or what I'm saying is that there is no one executive ego. There is no stable personality within a person. And that makes us uncomfortable because that is sort of telling us now you have no excuse not to change. And people don't like to hear that. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, the, that's probably not a satisfying answer on my part, but um, all I can say is that uh, instead of talking about the self or even the personality, we have to talk about something called the mind. Yeah. And the mind, this is where the earlier discussion of this, of systems theory comes in, that the mind is part of a system. It's part of a much larger system that networks out to other individuals, our friends, our family, society. Mm -hmm. And we really don't know where the mind ends or what the mind is. And I know that sounds very mystical, but that's really the only way that uh, I can answer it. And as I said, I struggle with this, this notion myself. And that that answer is as best as best anyone can. In a sense, it's we, a little bit of us dies every day. Yes, yes, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I I think this is it's a very tough tough topic to discuss. But I mean, I don't see it as a negative. I see it as being positive, because what it is saying is that you know you have a capacity of consciousness, capacity of you know projecting different possibilities, which is much larger than what you have done in the past. 
like to equate yourself with what you have done in the past is in some way to negate the potential of the future. So what you're saying is that you have the capacity of consciousness. That means you are able to look back at yourself, consider other possibilities. So it gives you a tremendous amount of freedom. With it comes tremendous amount of responsibility too. That means you are, you're capable of doing that. Um, and so it is scary in the sense that it is telling you have you have tremendous freedom, tremendous responsibility of shaping your life. Uh, and you have to figure it out. <laughs> so it is a tremendous, but at the same time, it's a very positive message of saying that, okay, you're not stuck with wherever, wherever you are, no matter what situation, good or bad, it is. So, so I see it as a positive thing, full of responsibility, full of freedom, full of, uh, you know, uh, variations, but a positive overall, because it points to large possibilities. And we have not even kind of begun to scope out what the possibilities are. So that's what, what is a little bit scary, because it's like, not only kind of there are unknowns, there are unknown unknowns out there. Uh, next up is going to be Mike, Govert and Laura. Mike. Okay. Um, um couple of uh, comments and then a question and I, I think I'd like some feedback on if you can work it into your schedule. Uh, the concept of, um, of uh, me and I, and uh, they're both continually changing and it's in the philosopher's stone equivalent of it's impossible to walk into the same river twice because that river is continually changing and it's a uh, it's a continuum of discrete uh, solutions. So, uh, so that's uh, one thing. Now, uh, uh, the pop philosopher Eckhart Tolle um, described his, some of the things of how he came to a distinction between uh, me and I. And, uh, uh, and, and his early stages that inspired him to become, from becoming a drug addict alcoholic to a becoming a philosopher, he, uh, uh, he reached a conclusion which he uh, expanded on in his book that uh, uh, I could no longer stand myself. And so I had to do something. And there are two people in the room, I and myself. And he goes into a lot of depth of what that meant. So uh, that's one, that uh, is one uh, uh, thread of thoughts. Uh, a second short thread of thoughts is uh, we've had, um, um, have you plugged into any of, the, uh, of uh, Shrikant's uh, expansion on uh, Russell Ackoff system theory, uh, Leonard Arnoff system theory, and uh, the OODA loop with how feedback loops go into this stuff? Have you, have you happened to audit any of his stuff on that subject? Well, along those lines, there's a big body of uh, uh, research on, uh, that was created by, after they mapped the human genome, on map, functionally mapping the human brain. And that's yielded some interesting results, and uh, including something called neural dynam uh, neural uh, uh, Darwinism uh, and uh, how they're plugging devices into the human brain. Mike, to, we're going so to that it, we're, we're going. Uh, to well, I'm looking for a system theory of transfer functions. When he said system theory, yeah, uh, we uh, when we were trying to plug all these things together, well, uh, there was a uh, th there's a thread that. I'm not equipped to follow, even though you gave me that assignment, but in collaboration, maybe we are equipped to follow it here. So I'll bring, I'll bring it to a close. Uh, um, the, um, uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on in how people learn in that context, how you learn how to use a new prosthesis, uh, why uh, people in, uh, in the inner city of Philadelphia, can't learn uh, uh, anything. Can't can't seem 
to get up to speed. Mike, I have and to give you five line, minutes man. now. Come on. All right. I'll, uh, I, I, if I, a, somewhere in all that, there's a question. Could, uh, could maybe uh, Brian answer some of that question if he, uh, if he can, Mike, if he can Mike. filter it out. Mike, don't do this. It's very interesting what you say, but it's too all over the place. It's impossible to follow. Brian, would you like to respond to anything? Just two um, uh, comments. This idea about um, getting to like yourself or do you like yourself. That's, that's one way to view the relationship between the I and the me. So with clients, when I get a, to know a client very well and I feel comfortable with them, I ask them that. Do you like yourself? And at first they're a little bit puzzled, but then I break it down to an I and a me and it makes sense to them. So I, I'm glad you, you brought that up, Mike. But then the other thing about mapping the brain, I know I'm not familiar with the research, really. It's not really my field, but uh, I think that's a, this is a good opportunity. This idea of mapping the brain, it's a good opportunity to bring up the point that mapping the brain is not the same thing as mapping the mind because the mind is always taking in more information. I'm not against mapping the brain. I think it's going to take us to fascinating places eventually. But from a philosophical point of view, a philosophy of mind point of view, we have to remember mapping the brain is different from mapping the mind. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is Govert. Uh, thank you again for this session, uh, Brian and Srikant. Uh, very enjoyable, very thought provoking. Um, you send us in with this, uh, uh, you know, to contemplate about these uh, uh, items, system, sequential and dramatized self. Uh, and you also added uh, the uh, time, the time element. And I've been studying Heidegger and Kant, and they are very much about, you know, how time formats our consciousness and our understanding. So I came up with a very simple little thing to integrate it. Like systems theory is about elements that are synchronic that are happening at the same time and that are mutually influence each other. With the sequential, we got diachronic, you know, we're going through the, the arrow of time. Uh, dramatization, um, that is the way to, to synthesize all this stuff together into a story with different elements and settings and roles and characters. And it has an enormous powerful way to understand and get a grip of your, on yourself and on your world. It's even so powerful that we do understand ourselves mostly in or within stories or through stories to the extent that some people are saying, you're nothing but a story. And what a story is, is a plot. And a plot is something that takes, you know, over time and creates a synthesis over time. So if you feel a unity of self, it's because of a story. But it might change, like a ship that might change, you know, all its elements while it's going, and in the end have no original elements <laughs> than when it started. It's still that same functionality of that ship. It's the same way, you know, you get up, you you eat, you do your stuff, and you keep going. So I would say that that the time element and narratization or narrative are one of the key ways to understand what we're talking about um, here. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, th th thank you, Gobert, for that. <clears throat> you know, the only thing I, I could say in response is that, as I've mentioned before, and we're all aware, you know, there is something called uh, for counseling narrative therapy. And again, there's a reason for that. And it's because, as you pointed out, storytelling to ourselves and to others and listening to those stories really is what constitutes us. And so it, it's not a coincidence that therapists have developed something called narrative therapy to help people look at stories that are hurting them, how to, re, how to rewrite those stories, how to come up with a, a new uh, self narratization Wonderful. I just want to point out that, I mean, the psychologist, uh, psychologist who is, whom I've learned a lot from, on this particular point is a psychologist called Magda Arnold. She takes the work of Thomas Aquinas uh, and Aristotle as a base. And her 
core point is the role of self ideal in a person's life. And she has this entire, uh, you know, theory of emotions, which is based on appraisals. And she does this thing called a story sequence analysis. So what, what is the story that you're uh, presenting? So it's very deep. And tomorrow at 12 o'clock, we are going to be talking about Thomas Aquinas approach to psychology uh, and his core idea of cogitative sense of how the rational faculty takes in all the experience that we have, all the memories that we have in order to produce an appraisal um, which guides us uh, in our life. So the, the role of that, role of the cogitative faculty, which is a very, very deep topic. And we are going to have three different people, three different scholars on Aquinas uh, talking about that. Uh, it's a radical departure from modern psychology, both from the experimental psychology and the depth psychology. So if you are interested in psychology, uh, you owe it to yourself to to uh, hear, hear that out. Uh, it's going to be very difficult because it's kind of bringing back Aristotle, bringing back uh, Aquinas and seeing how they, how they apply um, and think about human faculties. So, all right, Laura, what's your question? Oh, first a comment. I mean, again, it feels like topology, you know, you're, um, you're, you're taking a domain and you're morphing it and you wind up with a different object, but the domain is still the same that you start with. Um, so that's what I feel about the mind. So that's one thing. The other thing, being systems or whatever, can, if a traumatic uh, event occurs, it, it, let's say, would it, could it break in a way where the cognitive aspects um, are broken, but the more behavioral ones sort of remain intact so that the brain splits and the uh, mind splits in, in a certain way, such as that? Um, so to try and answer that question, <clears throat> many times uh, therapists will view uh, a person as being composed of a <clears throat> sort of a triangle, behavior, cognition, and emotions. And certainly if you suffer something traumatic, there may be cognitive elements or thoughts that you suppress, but emotionally, you still experience it. It doesn't mean that your mind completely erases any cognition of the trauma. That probably can't happen, but it will. It can suppress or repress certain cognitive elements. And then you will behave in a certain way um, that maybe gets you into trouble because you have not processed those thoughts yet, or your emotions may run very high. You may, as you know, uh, PTSD, you may be very irritable, have flashbacks, whatever, and you're not sure exactly what's going on. So I don't know if that answers your question um, completely, but I think it's a good way, it's a good place to begin to view any human being as having these this, this triangle of behavior, cognition, and uh, emotion. Uh, thank you, Brian. Next up is uh, Jade, Kev Kevin, and Rob. Jade. Uh, Jade, you need to unmute. <clears throat> yep. Um, I'm here. Um, so this whole thing is like, a, my mind is trying to wrap myself around um, the concepts being presented to me. Um, but I hear that there's quite a bit of confusion possibly still about the differentiating within this concept of what's being referred to when one says I versus when one says me. When I'm listening to that, I'm basically hearing a personification of the concepts of discretion and discernment. So the I is, is basically human discretion, human discernment. And it basically says, oh, we have this information. Let's think of it about, about it like this. And this is how we apply it to ourselves and our expression of ourselves in the world. And it feels like the me is basically that expression of whoever we are in the world. And it might take different forms. Um, I could probably, this whole thing, um, I was reassured that this is very complex. So on some level, I can feel already in my being that 
um, people are probably feeling I'm oversimplifying it, but I, I, I'm, I'm, again, I feel like it's just, again, a personification of discretion or discernment, whichever word you prefer, or a combination of the both. Um, and then I think I'm also kind of trying to figure out because there are so many concepts that people have thrown out into the world. So there's also the heart and <clears throat> the, the mind body connection, which is another sense. And then there's the, um, the mind and the heart connection. And then there's a the concept of values. So it's like, we have all these concepts just floating around and they're all disconnected. Um, so again, compartmentalizing things so much is generally just kind of like, for me, but I feel like this is a really big compartmentalization. So it's like, cause people are starting to talk about feelings and trauma and all this stuff. But like, how do you, how do you, how can any of us uh, <clears throat> assimilate those concepts into this concept when the I versus the me, they don't necessarily have the feelings, I don't know that the feelings have been attached to either side, the, the essence, the feelings, the, the, the life force, like if they're just conceptualized, they just feel like very dehumanized portions of the human consciousness. And I think that probably is what bothers me about most things when, when, when we compartmentalize is we dehumanize a lot. And so I, I, I'm just trying to figure out again, where all this fits, especially, you know, heart, mind, values, feelings, um, ethics, like how, how do those play in? Because I feel like your I, if without a concept of discretion, discretionary ethics or morals, your I can't lead your me. So that's, I'm gonna leave it at that. It's, it's a weird place to leave it, but I think I, I don't know what to make of it still. Okay. This, this me. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jade, for those comments. Um, yes, I, I, as I said, uh, this, this is not easy. I would not expect anybody to get it the first time they heard it or read about it. I still struggle with it uh, myself um, because these terms are slippery. But I, you said something that I, I think uh, is, is a useful view of the one type of relationship between the I and the me is to view the I uh, as uh, the super ego. And that's of course a Freudian term. So we have the super ego, the ego, and then the id. And so maybe in some situations, the I as a su super ego is judging the me that's acting like an ego or acting like an id. And I give that example to show there are many, many ways to fit different types of information into the relationship between the I and the me. And I think you're right. Sometimes these discussions can sound a bit dehumanizing because what we're doing is we're picking apart what it means to be human. We're picking apart the human psyche. And I know that uh, that can make anyone feel uncomfortable, but at the same time, I think it's the same thing in the operating room with a doctor. The doctor sometimes has to take an organ out to examine it or to fix something. That, that's a very violent act, surgery, right? But I think it's the same thing with, it's certainly the same thing in psychotherapy. And I think to a lesser degree, it's the same thing in daily interaction. Sometimes we have to, I wouldn't say dehumanize, but we do have to step out of ideas and concepts that we're familiar with that make us feel a bit uncomfortable in order to get a better idea of what's happening inside the psyche, inside the human mind. And you're right about, uh, you mentioned values. So I'm not talking about values today. However, I want to emphasize that we can't talk about the human condition ultimately, unless we also talk about values. The challenge with values, of course, they are a very individual thing and we all, are raised in different ways. We all come up with our different values, but most certainly the I and the me do involve values at uh, some level. Can, can I say just one more quick thing? Is Cause like, even if somebody's taking out an organ, you take out my heart, you take out my lungs. It doesn't matter what you're taking out. You can't take it out without acknowledging the whole because you take that out, you've affected the entire system. Yes. Now you're isolating that one, you're finding out that the issue is with that one thing, hopefully, knock on wood, but 
you, you can't do it without understanding how it works in tandem with everything else. Because if somebody who doesn't understand how my heart works in tandem with all my other systems, then I, I, I'm, I'm a goner. You, you can't fix me without understanding the relationships. And I think that's the biggest thing about psychology is the relationships or philosophy or anything. It's all about relationships. It's just like cooking. The people who know how to cook without a recipe, those are people who understand relationships. That's the relationships between the flour and the yeast and the water. And the, the understanding that different amounts, different temperatures, different environments, how all of those things work in tandem to create. Because you could use the same even quantities of the same ingredients and get different things, putting them in different environments, the temperature of the stove, the temperature of the room, temperature of the water, like all of that just, it, it just, I don't know. This is why, I, again, I know that that is my thing, which I come to these things because I think it's good for me to think of things in iso isolation. But I also, I guess when I come to things like this, it's always like, but when are we going to put it back in? What, and understand how to put it in and how to make sure that we understand how this isolated thing works in tandem with everything else. Yeah, so, you know, that, that's, I think you described that very well, uh, this idea, you, you can't just remove an organ, the heart from the body, right? Uh, you have to make sure the other systems are functioning and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so, Yes, so we are dissecting the human psyche. We're looking at these different aspects and some people can have a sense that we're dehumanizing the individual. Um, I mean, that's not the way I view it, uh, but uh, I, I guess it comes down to just making sure at the end of the day, we know how to put a person back together. And I think what puts us back together are social relationships and also what our values are. But as I said, values are a very individual thing. We have to acquire values, our own personal values as we go through life. Um, but um, yes, so, so thank you for your, your, your commentary. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jade. I mean, it's a great point. The, the point is actually epistemological because whole is all that matters and that's what we are all focused on. And epistemologically, you know, try to figure out what is going on. You're trying to see relationships. And the process of doing that is to kind of separate some things out and then identify the relationships. In the initial stage of doing that, it's going to be the, you know, you're not going to be able to see the whole as a whole because you understand the whole by taking it apart in some way and then putting it back together. And I think it's a process uh, of, of doing that. I mean, uh, so I, I think, but it's, it's an epistemological issue uh, because what happens is that like emotionally, we kind of react to the whole immediately. Like you, you react to a person, but then you can say, okay, why is it that you're reacting this way? And then you start to break it down. And only after a lot of work, you can achieve the same kind of wholeness that you had of your kind of immediate reaction, uh, but with a much greater kind of conceptual grasp of what is going on. So kind of understanding of causality um, behind a whole is a tremendously effort intensive and disturbing kind of a process. That, that's, that, that's what I would say. Uh, but, but great points, Jade, as always. Um, next up, I'm going to go with Ever, then uh, Kevin and Rob. Ever, go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to respond to Jay, but I'll just make a quick point to you, Brian. Uh, uh, Ever, could you speak into the mic? We can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Is that yes. Better? Um, so I was listening to Jay's point, and I think she's absolutely right. Compartmentalizing is difficult, especially when you're always ingrained in the whole. But I've come to a few lectures before that Sir Clinton's put on about stoicism. And as a fan of Stoicism, it's about understanding how to differentiate everything going on in your life or in your system and define what is true, what is false, and what you don't know. Um, if you can do those three, I think you can systematically develop the narrative of values and ethical behavior necessary to get to a point of congruence but it takes work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ever. 
Uh, next up is Kevin followed by Rob. Yeah, thank you. Come back for another question. It's uh, inspired by uh, Linda. Um, let's see what's traditionally we talk about ideal self, value, principle. Is this more linked to I? Then the opposite is goal is more related to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin. So to answer that question, do values, is it more of an I thing or a me thing? I would say neither. Values are a person thing. And a person has a mind. And the mind has to negotiate those values, figure out what, they, what a person should or shouldn't do. But the mind will manufacture as fictions the I and the me in order to have a conversation with itself. Because ethical decisions, moral problems can be very, very subtle and very complicated. And so it's better for the mind, of course, to have an I and a me to have a dialogue uh, and then that way hopefully make a, a better uh, decision. So to just sum up what I said, values and ethics, they're not something that the I or the me have, rather they are something that a person has. Thank you. Next up is Rob. Rob, what's your question? Uh yeah, question. Um, I wonder if Brian could elaborate on um, that do you like yourself question that he asks uh, his clients sometimes. Like, does this break down into the, uh, the me and the I? Uh, how do you break that down? Um, elaborate, please. Thanks. Well, I think, I think that um, with any individual, there's a fair amount of self deception that goes on. And with some people, there's a lot of self-deception and that can lead to all types of problems. Sometimes it leads to uh, um, uh, mental illness actually. So I get the sense from some people that they're struggling with other individuals because they, they're actually struggling with themselves. It's not just an interpersonal problem, it's an intrapersonal problem. And so the idea is to find out what part of you are you having a problem with? Let's talk about that. Is it something you did in the past you're ashamed of? Is it something that you think you, you might do in the future that you're ashamed of? Or is it some fear? Or do you beat yourself up? Are you, are you uh, a very bad critic of yourself? It could be any number of things. And a convenient, easy way to have a conversation with a person is to use these analogs and metaphors of the I and the me. And let's, you know, I mean, you can, this is uh, taken right from psychodrama where you can have uh, a person sit in a couch and pretend that there's another version of them across the room in another chair and say, okay, pretend you're talking to yourself who's sitting across the room to you. So you have an I in one corner of the room and a me in another corner of the room. It sounds like a very simple thing, but actually it can be a very uh, effective uh, exercise. Wonderful. Um, all right, folks. So um, let's first talk about what Brian is going to be doing next week. So Brian, we are talking about Psychology of the Bible, your book, Psychology of the Bible. Can you talk about, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? So, what I try to do in this book, and by the way, uh, not to plug my book too much, but it is published. It's in paperback. It's not too expensive if anyone wants to read up on it first. But basically what I do is I apply a Jamesian perspective on what is going on uh, in the Bible. I spend most of my time looking at the Old Testament. I am not a biblical scholar, um, but I do think that the Bible is a very convenient uh, collection of documents to test Jamesian theories. So if there is something truthful to what Jane said, it should be in the Bible. It's just a matter of knowing how to analyze the Bible. And basically, uh, that's what I try to do in that book. Uh, and so what we'll be doing is that um, we'll be talking about the book. I'm going to put a link for the book in the chat so you can have a look at, look at it. Um, and so that's what is coming up. And the week after that, we're going to be looking at metaphors. Uh, so we're going to be looking at language. So that's what is coming up. 
So, uh, Brian, thank you very much. This is uh, fantastic as always. Today was a particularly difficult topic. Yes, yes. Um, and <laughs> it is uh, challenging. It's a very challenging topic. And uh, I think we made, a, made some start at it and we will continue to talk about it from multiple angles. 